Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have all you esteemed people here, uh, maybe reliving a past experience at York, hopefully in a positive manner this time. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe rejuvenating your knowledge of, the, of nature, in particular today, the universe uh, uh, beyond the Milky Way. Uh, I'm going to, so let me just uh, get this thing rolling here, okay. The title of the talk says I'm going to be talking about structure in the universe. I, what structure means, I will come to tell you as we progress through the talk. Uh, I'm going to also talk about its relevance to your life, because as it turns out, we didn't know this before, structure locally in the universe appears to have a bearing on our destiny or has had a bearing on our destiny. So let's start off by talking about how science works. Uh, scientists are in the business of asking questions. Uh, we ask a question and then we devise a way of answering the question. It could be a theoretical experiment, it could be an observational experiment. Uh, nevertheless, the aim is to answer questions. So you proceed through some long and complicated process to try to answer the question. And uh, more often than not, you may stumble across something that leads you in a completely different direction. And uh, in the end, answering a question that you never asked in the first place. In other words, you can find something completely different than what you were looking for. And in fact, in the end, you may not even answer the original question. That's how science progresses. And what I'm going to talk about today epitomizes that process. I embarked on a study, well, something innocuous, and it turned out to provide us with insights into our origins. So uh, let's begin by talking about our place in the universe, at least insofar as we know it. Uh, really what this talk comes down to is, de is identifying our address. Now if you were an, uh, uh, an intergalactic postman, uh, and you said that your address was the Earth, I'm sorry, you would get no mail. <laughs> it's not precise enough. The Earth is nothing on the grand scale of the universe. You've got to give more details. And by the end of this talk, I will tell, be telling you how to define your address in the universe in enough detail that you might actually get some mail. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, give you some background into astronomy because I know not all of you are experts on astronomy. I'm going to give you some information about what I started to work on, how I got involved in studying the organization of matter locally, which is what I mean by structure. And then we'll talk about uh, the latest results, uh, latest findings in, in the field. Okay? So we begin uh, first by giving you some background about astronomy, and at, that begins with this object here. Uh, you know it as the Earth. We astronomers will call it a planet. And, but but in my, in, from my standpoint, I, I mean a body that does not shine by its own light. Okay? So that could be a rock that I could hold in my hand, or it could be a planet like the Earth. That's what I mean by a body that does not shine by its own light, and that, practic that is really the definition that matters to us today. That's a planet. And so the first part of our address is the planet Earth. Now, uh, once in a while, it's possible to see another body out there that does actually shine by its own light. Uh, you know it as the sun, we astronomers would call it a star. There are things going on inside this body, which nuclear processes that generate energy which filters to the surface and, and then floods out into the solar system as light, which illuminates and warms the planets of the solar system. Okay? So this is the second unit of astronomy, a star. So let's look at the solar system for a minute, and I'm going to use this to uh, tell you about how astronomers define sizes and scales, okay? because we have our own sort of language for that process, and I'm going to be using this language as we progress. So uh, I could, we, we could say that the distance from Toronto to Vancouver, for example, is 5,000 kilometers or something like that. And then we start getting the, you know, to working out the distance to the sun, and it comes out to be 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. It, it, you, you rapidly really lose contact with what those kinds of numbers mean. So astronomers have invented a different way of describing distances using, uh, the, using light as, as the measure. So uh, let's think about standing on a light beam and going to Vancouver. It takes the light beam one one hundredth of a second to go from Toronto to Vancouver. So all we do is we say the distance to Vancouver is one one hundredth of a light second. So we've converted time into a distance, right? You can re recognize the time 
yeah, as 0.1 hundredth of a second, but so we'll just relabel it a distance of a hundredth of a light second. And you could relate that to the time it takes light to travel there. Okay, so let's move farther afield. Let's ask ourselves, how big is the sun? Let, we can use a light beam to gauge its size. It takes a light beam five seconds to cross the sun. It's a big place compared to the distance of, well, the size of Canada. Five seconds across to get across the sun means its size is five light seconds. Okay. So uh, we can now come to the Earth and ask ourselves, how far is it to the sun? It takes a light beam eight minutes from the sun, to get from the sun to us. We would say that the sun is eight light minutes away. You may think there's a sun out there, but it could have gone out. You won't know for a few minutes, up to eight minutes. Okay. Now, the nearest star after the sun, beyond the sun, is pro called Proxima Centauri. It takes a light beam to get, it takes a light beam four years to travel from Proxima Centauri to us. So we would say the distance to Proxima Centauri is four light years. So you get the picture that we're living in a very big place and that the Earth is a moat in this place. Now, uh, another way of expressing sizes is to regard the Earth as a peppercorn. If the Earth were a peppercorn, the sun would be a basketball. Uh, if I placed the Earth over there, uh, the sun would be in the other corner of the room. And, uh, and the nearest star would be in Hawaii. Okay. So that gives you a sense of scale. I'm going to be the, using this concept of the light year in particular as we describe things that happen to be around us. So now we come to the third unit of astronomy. It's going to take me a while to delve into this to explain what it is. <coughs> it begins with this picture that you might see from Algonquin Park. There's a band of milkiness that goes across the sky. It's particularly visible in the summertime when it's, uh, when it's clear. Uh, and uh, we refer to that thing as the Milky Way. So uh, let's examine in more detail what the Milky Way is. We can take pictures of the sky, snapshots of different pieces of the sky in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, and we can piece them all together to make a map like you would see in an atlas of the Earth, right? A map of the whole Earth on a page. We can construct a similar map for the Milky Way, well, for the sky, the sky in the north and the south. And here is what this map looks like. You can see that this band of milkiness is not just confined to a part of the sky. It traverses the entire sky from the northern to the hem southern hemisphere and back again. And in fact, the left-hand side of this picture uh, actually links up with the right-hand side. This is a, the complete sky. So the Milky Way stands out in all its glory as this band crossed by dark lanes uh, that traverses the entire sky. So let's try to figure out what this is by homing in on a particularly bright part, say, in here, okay? So we'll zoom in, and we see that the Milky, so the Milky Way is just not, it's not milky anymore. It breaks up into myriads of stars, uncountable numbers of stars. Uh, and there other, appears to be a hole in the Milky Way. Uh, you can see that black blob over there. There's even a, there's a collection, a grouping of stars here. We know that as a cluster of stars. It's a collection of stars that were all born in the same place at the same time. People uh, like to live together in groups. Stars actually begin their lives in groups and ultimately over time leave the family and become part of the background of stars. Okay? Now, uh, this, this cloud here, yeah, that's known, that, that's, uh, that dark blob there is known as a cloud, uh, a dark cloud and it actually represents a fog bank. It's, a, it's near enough that it's obscuring the light of the Milky Way behind it. So it's not really a hole in the Milky Way, it's just, uh, it's just an obscuring volume where we are not able to see stars because their light is blocked by the fog bank okay, that happens to be in the foreground. Now, these dark clouds are believed to be the places that stars are actually born. They're representing not only volumes of dust, but also gas. It's the dust that's obscuring the light of the stars. And the dust, gets, the dust and gas gets clumpy and ultimately we collapse to form stars. If we look more closely into the heart of this cloud, we'll see the origin of stars. <laughs> okay, so now that we know how stars are made, we can find out more about the Milky Way. If we want to learn about the structure of the Milky Way, we have to be able to map it in three dimensions. This is just a two-dimensional view. We have to be able, in other words, to determine distances to individual things. 
Now, this is hard. Determining distances has occupied astronomers for 100 years, and we're still trying to determine distances well. Uh, I'll tell you why. The reason, let's examine, you know, any particular star in that field uh, has a certain brightness which you can quantify, okay? Let's talk about what determines the brightness of a star. Uh, there are actually three factors that determine the brightness. First of all, if you notice this cluster, uh, these are stars all at the same distance, but the stars don't at all have the same brightness. Some are brighter, some are fainter. Why is that? It's because stars have different wattages, like light bulbs. They're in they have differences in intrinsic brightness. So a star which is a high wattage light bulb appears like that or like that, and a star with a low wattage appears like one of the fainter stars in that cluster. Okay? So wattage goes into determining apparent brightness. Now, we see also a background of very faint stars compared to the cluster. Why is that? It's because distance affects brightness, and all these stars you see here are, are stars that are at greater distances. Now, they don't also don't have the same wattage, right? But on average, they're so far away that they all appear dim, okay? And so uh, distance is fundamental in setting how bright a star appears. Uh, sadly, there's one other factor that determines the brightness of a star, and that is fog. Uh, you, could, you may see a star that appears dim, and you might attribute it to it being far away or having a low wattage, but sadly, it could also be because there's a fog bank in the way, and it could be very nearby, but the light is obscured by the fog, by the cloud of dust that happens to be in the way. So to actually determine the positions of things in space, you have to take out the effects of dust clouds somehow, the, uh, the, fo the fog that happens to be in the way. In the end, if you can take out the fog, you can measure the apparent brightness of a star, and knowing its wattage by fancy techniques that people have developed for over 100 years, thereby determine the distance, because that's the only thing left that's, re that's determining the apparent brightness given a wattage, okay? So people have spent a long time mapping constituents of the Milky Way, and this is what we've come up with. Coming back to this picture again, we believe now that we live in a giant pancake with a bump in the middle, okay? Uh, and let's think for a moment about sitting in a frying pan, making a pancake. So if you're standing amongst the batter, okay, uh, and look along the surface of the pancake, you'll see a whole lot of batter, no matter which way you look. Okay? That is the milkiness of the Milky Way. That's the batter along the surface of the frying pan. Now, imagine looking up out of the frying pan. You see many fewer particles of batter. That is all the stars up here and down here, if you were to look down, if you could see through a frying pan. So, in fact, this picture here, this milkiness is not the whole story. That, the Milky Way is, in fact, everything you see in that picture. Not only the band of milkiness, but the batter above and below, the, the directions up and down out of the pancake. We call this entity, this enormous structure that spans the entire sky, a galaxy. And it represents an island universe floating in space uh, with with lots and lots of stars, gas and dust, all bound together by the mutual effects of gravity. Now, now that we have a three-dimensional picture of the Milky Way, we can go into outer space and look back down on the Milky Way. And I'm going to show you our best guess as to what the Milky Way looks like from afar. That's what we live in. It's a pancake from the side because we're inside, inside it, right? We're inside this disk that I have been referring to as the pancake. But in fact, it, the pancake has structure in it. It has what's called spiral structure. There are arms that, are coming off, come, that come from the inside all the way to the farthest reaches of the Milky Way. So you'll obviously want to know where we happen to be located. That is where we are. Um, we are not somewhere halfway to the edge, the edge as being defined by this picture anyway. And that distance between us and the center of the Milky Way is 27,000 light years, a scale vastly greater than what I just talked about when we were considering the solar system. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, this entity, the galaxy, is held together by the mutual gravitational attraction of everything. It looks like there's some central concentration of mass here that might act like the sun and hold everything to it. 
As it turns out though, the mass that's associated with the center is far too tiny to hold this vast structure together. In, it's, it, you require the combined effects gravitationally of everything on everything else to hold this together. It's spinning. It spins once every about 210 million years. Okay? So since the universe began uh, 14 billion years ago, the, Earth, the, the Milky Way has actually spun several times, and this is the way it spins like that. Okay? Uh, now, one thing, uh, this is referred to as a spiral galaxy for obvious reasons, because of the, the, the morphology of the so-called arms. Uh, one thing that we believe about spiral galaxies is that they formed incrementally. That uh, we initially, in the earliest days of the universe, there was some sort of uh, seed uh, <coughs> that exerted a gravitational influence on matter around it. And uh, matter around it drew closer and was accreted onto this seed. And as a result, over time, this disk grew into what it has become today, this enormous structure that we live in, the Milky Way. Okay? So remember that. A spiral galaxy, the disk that we live in, uh, grows as a result of accretion over, gradually over a period of time. This will become important later on. So, now let's talk, I mentioned that the galaxy spins. Let's talk a little bit more detail about spin. Okay? So, uh, first I'll use as uh, an example the solar system. All the planets are going around the sun. If you like, the solar system is spinning. Okay? Uh, uh, but the key thing is, as the, the, the planets farther out go around the sun slower than the planets closer in. And the reason is because the force of gravity falls off with distance from the sun. And so a planet doesn't have to move as fast to maintain its position farther out uh, because the force of gravity is weaker there. Now, when we examine how fast stars are going around the Milky Way, as a function from di of distance from the center, this is what we see. This is the velocity at which a star is moving around the center of, this, uh, of the galaxy. And this is the distance from the center in thousands of light years. So this is 30,000 light years. And uh, I mentioned that for the solar system, we have velocities falling with distance. But for the Milky Way, we see velocities rising and then leveling off and remaining uh, flat as far out as we're able to measure. Uh, the only way this is possible is if you have more and more mass and, uh, within whatever radius you happen to be measuring your velocity. In other words, there, the only way to explain this is if there is matter there exerting more gravity than can be exerted by what you see. Forcing objects at large radii to move faster to maintain their positions with respect to the rest of the matter in the galaxy. It's this, this, the way that the Milky Way spins says that we are, we are only seeing something like 10% of the matter of the Milky Way as stars and gas. That in fact the Milky Way is even more enormous than we had anticipated. Besides the 300 billion stars that it has, uh, it has another factor of 15 more stuff in a halo around it which we say is dark matter. We don't know what dark matter is. It's only evidenced by its gravitational influence on things, such as the orbits of stars. But we now know that a galaxy like the Milky Way, all galaxies, uh, seem to have this gigantic halo of dark matter in which the pancake in w uh, of which we're a part happens to be embedded. Okay? So dark matter is a major, major component of matter in the universe, probably representing 90% of the matter in the universe, or maybe even more. Okay, let's move farther afield now and expand our horizons into the greater universe. Uh, the next big galaxy that we come to, the next big island universe, is called Andromeda. Uh, Andromeda is a galaxy like ours, a spiral galaxy. It's even got a couple of satellites here and here that are going around it. These are galaxies maybe one hundredth the size of Andromeda in terms of numbers of stars. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away, okay? And it's a part, with us, of a grouping, a small collection of galaxies known as the local group. There are about 70 galaxies, most of which are extremely small, confined to a space of about seven million light years apart, a little bigger than this field here. So uh, the biggest one of those little galaxies is called Messier 33. 
Now what's interesting is that the Andromeda galaxy here is actually moving towards the Milky Way, almost directly towards the Milky Way. In fact, so the Milky Way and Andromeda form what we call a binary system, an orbiting pair of galaxies with a funny orbit where they're coming directly towards each other right now. Uh, we are able to use that orbital motion to actually ascertain how much matter is contained in these galaxies. And it confirms what I just told you, that the vast majority of the matter, not only the Milky Way but also Andromeda, is dark, cannot be seen. It's the only way you can uh, describe the motions of the galaxies with respect to each other. The halo, by the way, of the Milky Way probably is more than one million light years across. Uh, similarly with Andromeda, so we're talking about a halo that's only about one-third uh, as big as the separation between Andromeda and the Milky Way. Going farther afield, there are other groups of galaxies. This is known as the M81 group. That's M81, M82, there's another galaxy up here. But what's interesting about this image is it shows you uh, this, these, uh, <coughs> these wispy things across the entire field of view. What are these wispy things? That's the fog of the Milky Way. So to see the universe beyond, we have to look through this fog. And if you want to ascertain any information about the distances to any of these objects, you have to compensate for the effects of fog, the dimming effects. Make them appear fainter than they should be. If you didn't, if you didn't know it was there, you'd think the galaxies were farther away than they ought to be because they appear dim, right? So we'll go even farther afield and we come to uh, an enormous cluster of galaxies known as the Virgo Cluster. And the Virgo cluster is something, it's about 50 million light years away and about 10 million light years across. An enormous structure with thousands of galaxies in it. Now, these galaxies look quite a bit different, the big ones anyway, from Andromeda and the Milky Way. There's one here, here, here. The black circles, by the way, are masks to hide bright stars that happen to be in the Milky Way in this direction. Okay? That's, they're not black holes or anything like that. Uh, let's examine one of these galaxies more closely. That's called Messier 87. It pretty much has no structure. The stars are orange, which means they're actually cold and old. It's composed exclusively of very old stars. This is known as an elliptical galaxy. And elliptical galaxies are among the biggest galaxies in the universe. They're a lot different from spiral galaxies like ours. They don't have any gas in them. And because they don't have any gas, they are not forming any stars because there's no raw materials to form stars. Okay? They're also cannibals, they eat their own kind. Here's a couple, oops, that's a couple of, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, here's a couple of uh, poor souls that are falling into M87, soon to lose their identity and become a part of Messi 87. Okay, so uh, now an elliptical galaxy, we believe, formed a different ray from a spiral galaxy. We believe they formed monolithically, long ago, soon after the Big Bang, that there was an enormous burst of star formation that built the galaxy up from the inside to the outside in one place. Not, maybe there was accretion later on, like for the spiral galaxies, the Milky Way, but mono, this is a monolithic formation process that we believe led to uh, elliptical galaxies. Okay? Now, why do they have no gas? We think that because the star formation burst was so violent, the gas became really, really hot, so hot that the gravity of the elliptical galaxy could not hold it anymore. And so, during the formation process, the gas blew away as a wind. And when the galaxy was evacuated of gas, it stopped forming stars. And now, the stars have just been aging ever since to the present day. Uh, now, I want you to focus your attention on the s little grains of what appear to be salt around this thing. Okay? We're going to home in on one of those grains. That's what it is. It's called a globular cluster. It's in its own right got a million stars in it. Right? And that gives you a sense of how enormous this body is. Just one of those grains of salt is a million stars. So now, let's concentrate on the galaxies. Let's try to remove the effects of the Milky Way altogether and see where the galaxies in the sky are located. Now, when you look at a galaxy at first with a monoculars or something, you normally see a bunch of stars and a fuzzy blob. Okay, that fuzzy blob is a galaxy. So what I'm going to do is we're going to create a map of the sky with all the stars removed and only the galaxies left behind. And we'll see how they're organized. Okay, so here it is. Every one of those dots 
is a Milky Way class galaxy with 300 billion stars in it. They're not stars, these are galaxies, okay? So let's ask ourselves, what are the features here? The galaxies clearly are not organized uniformly over the sky. There is a band of galaxies that traverses the sky here. That is a new level of structure in the universe greater than the groups and clusters I've already talked about. It's called the local supercluster. And it is a cluster of groups and clusters of galaxies. That includes the Virgo cluster. We happen to be on the periphery towards you, uh, about 50 million light years away from the center. It traverses a distance something like 150 million light years across space. Uh, now, there is another feature here, a band of darkness. Is this a hole in the universe? It's not a hole in the universe. It represents this. It's the Milky Way. It's the Milky Way blocking our view of the universe behind, behind because of all the fog that happens to lie in the pancake that is our Milky Way. So, so this, the, if one were to be able to uh, overcome the obstacle that is the dust of the Milky Way, one would expect to find lots of galaxies in this dark lane known as the zone of avoidance. <laughs> so that's where I come in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, only masochists would want to work on galaxies in the zone of avoidance, but that's where I kind of got interested in that. So, uh, but before we get on to that, I want to talk about th this picture I just showed you before. This is in two dimensions. This is how galaxies are arranged on the sky. Like the Milky Way, we'd like to know how things are arranged in three dimensions. So let's go forward and figure out how we can determine how things are arranged in three dimensions. So, uh, a long time ago in, 19, in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble uh, made measurements of how fast galaxies are moving through something called the Doppler shift and independently measurements of how far away they are with great difficulty and with great uncertainty. And it's easy to measure a Doppler shift and a velocity, it's hard to measure a distance. And he plotted a graph of velocity versus distance and he found that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. Okay? And as I, uh, key thing here, Moving away, we're living in an expanding universe. That's what Hubble found in 1929. So uh, this, this is just a graph that demonstrates that velocity grows as you get farther and farther away. And this distance here, uh, a hundred, this is about 300 million light years. So he's going really, really far out. So uh, now some people decided that, well, this simply says that velocity can be used as a proxy for distance. Because the two are correlated, we don't have to measure the distance, that's too hard. We can just go out and measure the velocities of recession of galaxies and represent that as the distance. Or maybe we can convert it into a distance using this law here, right? So that's what people did, and I'm going to show you a, th a map, a slice of the universe that has been judged by using Hubble's law to gauge how far away galaxies are. So, if we are at the point of what you might regard as a pizza. We're looking at, a, at, a, at an angle like this, right? A pizza slice. It's got a small vertical dimension on the sky, but it's got a wide horizontal dimension in an angular sense. And we're putting a dot down for every single galaxy that happens to be in that slice. And now you can see that there is a profound irregularity in the organization of galaxies in, the, in, in space in three dimensions. There are filaments like this, known as the Great Wall. Filaments going this way. This feature here is known as the Finger of God. As it turns out, the Finger of God is an artifact and it's not real. Uh, you can ask me why later. And then this great structure here is known as the Sloan Great Wall. And then, but you can also see regions of space where there are no galaxies. They're, they're known as voids. And intersections of filaments are called nodes. And if you were to look in vertically as well, there you would see that there are sheets. So we, we live in this unusual structure. It's kind of like a honeycomb, uh, where galaxies outline these vast regions of space that are empty. Okay? So people have been interested in the topology of this configuration. And you might, they considered the possibility that it's like foam, or Swiss cheese, or or sponge, a sponge, 
okay? And if you think carefully, those three things have subtly different topologies. And as far as we can guess right now, we live in a sponge. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's how things, how matter is organized in the universe. How did we get to this state? How, how, did, how did it come to be? Uh, there's a theory known as lambda CDM, that upside down V is called the Greek, is the Greek letter lambda. The CDM stands for cold dark matter. It's a universe in which matter is mostly dark. I already mentioned we, the evidence for that. As well, we live in a universe which is not only expanding, but whose, ex, whose expansion is accelerating, meaning that there has to be a tension in space, which is growing, in fact, as the volume grows, causing the, accelerate, causing the expansion to accelerate. That's the lambda. It's a, it's, it's a symbol for a term in Einstein's theory of general relativity, which causes a universe to expand and accelerate as it's expanding. Okay? So, let's, we're going to watch now a simulation of the development of structure in the universe. Those nodes, sheets, filaments, voids, that's what we refer to officially as structure in the universe. How did the structure develop? What I'm showing you here is a simulation starting only 50 million years after the Big Bang. At a time when space had hardly any structure, only small subtle variations in density as you can see here in this sort of patchy purple uh, distribution of light. This is a simulation for the development of structure in dark matter only. There is no normal matter here out of which we're made. Why? Because it doesn't matter. The, dark, the, the normal matter is going to follow the dark matter. I'm sorry, sorry, we don't matter, right? <laughs> <laughs> the normal matter is expected to follow the dark matter because the dark matter is by far the bulk of matter, 90% of it. It's going to be generating the most gravity. It's going to pull the normal matter with it. So what you see happening to the dark matter, you can anticipate will also be followed by the normal matter. We're going to carry this simulation forward 14 billion years to the present time. And you will see along the way the development of structure and ultimately the development of a Milky Way class galaxy, at least as seen in the light, is not the light, as seen for dark matter. Okay, so here we go. So that's the power of gravity in an expanding universe. And that is how the halo 
a dark, dark matter around the Milky Way, we believe, developed. All right, now let's go back to this picture of the galaxies spread all over the sky in two dimensions and how I got involved in the exploration of structure in the universe. Uh, I was interested in galaxies, very few of them known, that happened to lie in the zone of avoidance. Uh, here's one of them called IC342. You can see it looks like a spiral galaxy, although very ratty, because there happens to be a lot of fog in this direction, obscuring its appearance. And as a consequence of that, for one thing, people didn't know how much fog. And for another thing, because of the uncertainty, uh, its faintness, the faintness of this galaxy, was interpreted as being, representing it being at a very great distance, in fact, 30 million light years. There's another galaxy in the zone of avoidance that was known called MAPI-1. It just disappears as this little patch blobby thing here. Hardly anything was known about it, including its, dist its distance was not known. We suspect that it might actually be, if it was nearby, as big as this ellipse here. Okay? But without actually a measurement of its brightness, it was not possible even to address uh, how far away it was, uh, let alone how big it was. So um, we were interested in going to observe these galaxies to determine their distances. As I mentioned to determine a distance, you have to take into account the obscuring effects of fog. How do you do it? Well, let's consider the sun at sunset. The sun, as it sets, gets dimmer. And the reason it gets dimmer is because the light has to pass through more and more of the atmosphere, smog if you like. Okay? Uh, simultaneously, this is the reason you can look at it at sunset, is because it is dimmer, otherwise you'd go blind. Uh, if in, now, simultaneously with its dimming, the sun also gets redder, it changes color. Okay? And, so, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. You know, when it's overhead it appears more white, and when it's at sunset it appears almost red. So we are actually able to use this relationship between color and dimming to arrive at a way to determine how much fog affects the light of a galaxy. All you got to do is go out and measure its color, and knowing what color it would be with no dust in the way, you are then able to assess how much dimmer the galaxy appears as a result of fog along the line of sight. And once you take out the effects of fog, a straight measurement of brightness combined with a knowledge of wattage gives you its distance. Okay, so where did we go to do this? We went to Kitt Peak National Observatory, and you might think to observe faint things like galaxies, you might want to observe this, you, this telescope, but in fact it turns out that we use the littlest, well one of the littlest, this one here. Why? Because this particular telescope, one, allowed you to see a large patch of sky at one time in one picture. And we thought if these galaxies in the zone of avoidance were actually nearby, uh, in other words, people got the distances wrong, uh, then they might actually appear quite big on the sky, and we didn't want to miss that. Uh, we, if you used a big telescope like this, you might just see a tiny piece of the sky and never know. The second thing is, it, is a, a, it had on the end of it a detector which was sensitive to light that penetrated dust really well. I mentioned things become red, the sun becomes red at sunsets because the blue light is preferentially scattered compared to the red. So the red is very good at penetrating, but even better is infrared, beyond the red. Light is really good at penetrating dust, and this telescope had a detector on the end of it which was sensitive to infrared light. So we observed with this telescope, this actually the size of this telescope is actually the same size as the telescope here in one of the telescopes at York. Although the telescope at York has a different optical design. Here is, MAF I, here is IC342 imaged with in the near infrared with this telescope. And you can see it kind of looks orangey as we would have expected because of all the obscuring fog along the line of sight. Of course there's another difficulty. You'll notice that there's all these stars sitting on top of it. Those are the stars of the Milky Way. You know, we're looking in the zone of avoidance, we're looking right along the plane of the frying pan where all the batter is. We see not only dust but we're also seeing all the stars of the Milky Way. So we have to get rid of them too. Well that took a few years. But anyway, uh, here it is, the galaxy with the stars, and there it is, a beautiful spiral galaxy with all the stars removed. Okay? From the color, we were able to estimate the amount of dimming by dust, and it turns out that IC342 appears six times fainter than it would if there was no dust in the way. If there was no dust in the way, it would appear as big as the full moon. If there was no dust in the way, uh, it, would, it would be the third brightest galaxy in the northern sky but it's very dim because of all the dust. 
and the distance turns out to be not 30 million light years, but 11 million light years, which is only four times farther away than Andromeda. Here is Maphi 1, and you can see this is really red. It's heavily obscured by dust. It doesn't look like a spiral galaxy. Here is Maphi 1 before and after the stars have been removed. It's an elliptical galaxy. Uh, if there was no, the, the obscuring effects of dust make this galaxy appear 70 times fainter than it would appear if there was no dust in the way. It would be about 75% of the size of the full moon if there was no dust in the way. It would be the fourth brightest galaxy in the northern sky without dust. And interestingly, it also is 11 million light years away in our own backyard. So when you th find things like this, you start asking yourself <laughs> questions like what else is out there, right? Uh, and so let's come back for a moment to this picture. Uh, I got interested in knowing what was out there, not on large scales, but on small scales. And I was particularly interested in knowing what might be out there, what structure might be out there, of which we're a part, okay? And I've wanted to focus my attention on the very little tiny orange bit of this, of this diagram. Now, think about it. If we're embedded in something, just like the Milky Way, you're gonna, it'll be this way and this way and this way. You have to look up and down, left and right. You've got to examine the entire sky to find it, right? It's everywhere. So it's a challenge to map out structure of which we are a part. And uh, so how do you do that? Uh, well, I went and decided to examine every bright galaxy out to about 35 million light years, which is a lot, most of the way to the Virgo cluster. Now, how does one get distances to map out where these things are in three dimensions? We can go back to Hubble's law and ask ourselves, can we do what PV previous people did for mapping structure? Can we just use how fast they're moving to get the distance? No. Uh, another challenge of working in near space. And the reason is this. Here's a picture of uh, the speed at which a galaxy is moving as a function of distance, including the Virgo cluster. And you'll notice when we get to the Virgo cluster, there are points all over the place. And if you were to say, say for this point here, let, or let, how about this point here? This point here, you measure its velocity, and you would guess that its distance is way over here, right? If you use Hubble's law, when in fact it's here. Why, why is there all the scatters? Because there's more to motion in space than just the expansion of the universe. Uh, galaxies also have, on top of the expansion of space, their own peculiar motions set up by the gravitational influences of, of all the other pieces of matter that are floating in the universe. So nothing is moving perfectly with the expansion, with space. Okay? Everything's moving like bees, uh, with their own little trajectory at some level on top of the expansion of space. And particularly when you get close by, those so-called peculiar motions become quite significant relative to the expansion of space. And if you look over here, there's even velocities, there are even galaxies with negative velocities. And if you use Hubble's law to get the distance, you get a negative distance. You can't use Hubble's law to get, to map out where galaxies are close by. You have to resort to more difficult means. And here's three of them. Uh, first of all, there are stars out there that pulsate. And they pulsate periodically with, with a period of many days. They change their brightness over a period of many days like clockwork. It turns out that the frequency with which they pulsate is related to their wattage. And we can use the frequency with which, their pulsate, with, with, with which they pulsate to get the wattage, measure the apparent brightness, and you can get a distance. This is the, represents the end of a life of a sun-like star. At the end of the sun's life, it will grow to be the size of the Earth's orbit. It'll become a red giant. And at that phase, it will actually blow away its atmosphere very slowly, okay, a as a wind, exposing the hot inner core, which then, then sends out ultraviolet light to the gas that's blowing away, causing it to be ionized, causing it to be stripped of its electrons and to glow. So this is known as a planetary nebula. And it turns out that a planetary nebula's peak brightness is a constant of nature. It's a wattage that we can measure. And if we measure the apparent brightness of a planetary nebula and know its wattage, we can get the distance. Planetary nebulae are found all over the place in galaxies because sun-like stars are. And we see sun-like stars dying all over the place. Finally, uh, you'll notice in this picture of a galaxy known as a large Magellanic cloud, there are all kinds of stars that are reddish here. Those are red giants like I just described, died as a planetary nebula. As it turns out, the maximum brightness that a red giant becomes also is a constant of nature. 
So you can gauge the wattage of a red giant, thereby measure its apparent magnitude and get the apparent brightness and get the distance to any place where red giants happen to be hosted, which, for example, would be any galaxy. OK, so putting all this together, examined, 30, examined every bright galaxy, every galaxy brighter than uh, about 2% of the Milky Way out to a distance of about 35 million light years. And out of that sample, uh, selected one quarter of the volume, that part of the volume centered on the Milky Way. And this is what it looks like. This is every known galaxy brighter than 2% of the Milky Way. In other words, none have been missed. They're considered so bright that no, nothing could be missed. Uh, within 20 million light years of us, everything is to scale. The symbols are scaled according to the size of the dark matter halos. And, uh, and they're color coded on the basis of whether or not they're big galaxies, bigger than 8% of the Milky Way, or little ones in blue, uh, less than 8% of the Milky Way. You can see that, and as I say, this is every known galaxy within 20 million light years. They are confined to this pancake, a sheet, as we call it, known as the local sheet. <laughs> and that local sheet has dimensions, it's, it's a factor of 20 times thinner than it is in extent. Okay? Uh, the pink is us, the red is Andromeda. And uh, you'll notice that on either side of the sheet there's nothing. Well, if you look more closely, there are little tiny things down here, but they're not in my sample because they're not, they don't, they're not worthy. Uh, but up here, there's not a whole lot of anything, and that's, that's, regarded, uh, that's called the local void. And the local void is seven times bigger in extent than the local sheet. Let's look at this from above. Here's a picture of the local sheet from above. And you can see that the giants in yellow are not randomly distributed, but occupies kind of a ring around the local group, Andromeda and the Milky Way and its little dwarfs. Uh, that's been called by me the, lo the Council of Giants. Okay? And I'll tell you why it's got that name later on. Uh, and you can see that we're not at the center. That's a good thing in astronomy. You know, uh, uh, Ptolemy said that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that was wrong. And, uh, people have said, uh, there were other people that said that the Milky Way is the center of the universe, and that was wrong. It's very bad to say that we're the center of anything, and luckily, we're not the center of this. <laughs> so these are the galaxies that make up the Council of Giants, uh, sort of to scale. The one down here, even though it doesn't look very big, is actually a very big galaxy. It just looks small because it's seen from the side. Okay, so let's examine this in a little more detail. First of all, let's pay attention to the fact that the line connecting Andromeda and the Milky Way is actually not very highly tilted with, the plane, with respect to the plane of the local sheet. It's only 11 degrees from the plane. It's as if the Milky Way and Andromeda, the local group, felt the presence of its environment and somehow has ended up with an axis that lies close to the plane. Another interesting aspect is the time it takes a galaxy to go traverse the plane vertically. We know roughly how long it takes a galaxy to travel vertically. Uh, it's, it's about 10 billion years. It's a large fraction of the age of the universe. Okay? So uh, it's a, that, it means that this sheet cannot be in a state of gravitational equilibrium. There hasn't been time for the galaxies to feel each other enough and respond to each other and adjust. So this structure, which is expanding with the universe, uh, is still in, trying to adjust gravitationally to the presence of the matter within it and may never do so. So let's examine the view from above again. Uh, there are two very interesting galaxies in this system of the Council of Giants. There, two, there are only two ellipticals. They are Centaurus A and Maphi 1, that big elliptical that we found, which turns out to be the nearest giant elliptical in the universe. Um, now, if you examine the line connecting them, you'll notice that the axis of the Milky Way and Andromeda is roughly parallel to the line connecting the, two, the, two, the only two giant ellipticals, again suggesting it to you that our configuration is somehow related to the environment in which we find ourselves. Remember, these ellipticals were laid down first. They, if you like, were the most prominent uh, mass concentrations very early on, and perhaps they somehow played a role in our development, particularly in the formation of a binary system in between them, because we are a member of an interacting binary system. Okay, now another thing I mentioned, when an elliptical galaxy forms, it rapidly heats up and it blows away its gas as a wind. 
Centaurus A and Maphi would, one, early on, would have had winds that would have blown out like I, I showed you and potentially shepherded material in the neighborhood towards the Milky Way and Andromeda. In other words, perhaps accelerating the rate at which material accreted onto the Andromeda and the Milky Way, accelerating our growth to become what we be, have become today. What time is it? Um, this is a landscape. We call it a potential surface, but you can regard it as a landscape of hills and valleys. The blue and the purple represent valleys. The red, the, the red represents hills. Green and yellow are in between. And you can see, if you put a marble on this thing, it'll roll from a hill down here, down into the lower levels, maybe down into one of the valleys. So uh, the point of this diagram is to show you that it, along this direction, it's kind of like a ridge. It goes downhill this way and downhill that way. Um, if we happen to be, if the Milky Way in Andromeda was close to the center of the council here a long time ago, it would have not have stayed there forever because it's on a, in a point of instability. It's got to roll down one way or the other. We can measure the direction it's moving, in fact, and we find out that if we're moving towards MAFI 1 and MAFI 2. So, uh, so, in fact, this shows you that in the past we were actually closer to the center of the council. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit more, and I've forgotten what I was going to say, let's quickly look over here, oh yeah, uh, the, you'll notice that the Milky Way and Andromeda appear to be in a region which is empty, right? It's as if the formation of the Milky Way and Andromeda has evacuated the space around it. Uh, so let's imagine originally that the matter in the council and the matter in the, in the local group was evenly distributed. If we require that the matter have been evenly distributed in density, uh, we can work out sort of where the boundaries of their realms of influence were. Where the boundaries confining the matter that accreted onto the Milky Way and Andromeda might have been. And here they are. Okay? So originally the, the matter of the, of the local group was spread around the pink zone. It would have had the same density as the matter spread around the yellow zone. Okay? Now, we can also look at forces today. Okay? Forces balance, if you, uh, balance along the white lines. So if you, were, if you were standing on the white line, you would feel a pull towards the local group equal to the strength of the pull in the other direction away. So the pink boundary, which we judge just by having matching densities, re is, is reflective of a balance of forces. So the pink boundary represents the limit over which the, the local group could have accreted the material out of it, which it is made. Because beyond that boundary, matter would have headed towards the council giants, ultimately forming them. So it's in essence then, the council stands in gravitational judgment of the local group by restricting the food, if you like, that was available to feed us during our development. I don't think time will allow me to talk about spin, so I'll pass on that. <laughs> Unless you want to hear about it later. Uh, we, uh, we, we now know that Milky Way is a, the Andromeda is approaching the Milky Way on a radial orbit. Okay? It's a, in other words, we're part of a binary. The binary may well be a consequence of where we formed in the local sheet between these two giant ellipticals. As it turns out, the spins of galaxies around us also appear to have been affected by the Milky Way and Andromeda. Possibly the, we had a lot of orbital motion originally, which was then transferred into spin of the giants around us. And that orbital motion was lost to the point that we're actually approaching each other today. Those two things combined have led to the following fate.
So that's what you have to look forward to. <laughs> I have one last thing necessary to talk about to define completely our address in the universe. Okay? There is something else out there that was revealed around last year as well. Uh, here is a map a billion years, light years across of galaxies, if you like, in our neighborhood. The arrow points to where we are there. Every dot is a galaxy. It's about 8,000 galaxies plotted, even though there are actually more out there. I mentioned that galaxies respond to gravitational effects of neighbors. Okay? So they have motions that are not only associated with the expansion of space, but also uh, associated with the, mo with the gravitational influences of things around them. People can actually turn this around. If, they can measure, if people can measure distances to galaxies and also motions independently, then it's possible to use the motions to determine the matter that has generated the motions in the first place. And the color coding defines where the mass concentrations actually are. So the red part is the Virgo cluster. Okay? Uh, there's a void indicated in blue here. The green areas represent enhancements of matter, some of which is seen in the form of galaxies, a lot of which is not. It's dark. Okay? Now, we can connect, now that we know where the galaxies are distributed, where the matter is distributed, now that we know where the, how the galaxies are moving, we can connect galaxies with comparable motions together and form streamlines, like I show here. This is a watershed that, of which we are a part, uh, where galaxies are all flowing in an organized manner. It actually has a name. It's called Lania Kea, and it's 550 million light years across. We are on a, if you like, a rivulet that is flowing into the river that is connecting the Virgo cluster to a mass bo massive body of water known as the Great Attractor. Okay? Here's how it all works. Uh, here's some other watersheds. And if we examine what would happen. So what you just saw there is what would, what would happen if the universe was frozen, if it stopped expanding? Those kinds of flows would materialize. But you have to remember, the universe is expanding at the same time, the flows are occurring at the same time. These galaxies will never meet. They'll, the flows will never run to completion, but they do represent organized systems on the largest known scales that exist. We are a part of a body known as the Lania Kea supercluster. So let's summarize everything here. Here is biology to a physicist. <laughs> here is astronomy to, uh, here is the universe to an astronomer, okay? That tooth is the Milky Way. <laughs> the mouth is the local group. The face is the local sheet and its council of giants, if you like, the face of local structure. The body is the local supercluster. The car is Lani Achaia, driving down a road to a destination that has yet to be determined. Now, what about the Earth and the Sun? The Sun is a proton in the tooth. The Earth is a hundred times smaller, maybe ten times bigger than the largest quark. So, what do we do next? <laughs> There's only one local sheet, and there's limits as to how much you can learn about it by virtue of being within it. We need to find more examples of environments like Lars out in the greater universe to address many of the burning issues that I've raised. For example, does the presence of a pair of ellipticals determine whether or not a binary forms? Is the Council of Giants a real structural entity, or is it an accidental configuration? Is there matter spread between the galaxies in a sheet? that we can't see, as the simulation suggested. Dark matter representing the framework out of, out of which galaxies born. Well, progress is being made by virtue of this man, who is my PhD student, who is <laughs> on the front page of the GTA section of the Toronto Star last week. Uh, his name is George Kanidis, and he has found a hundred and some systems like ours in the greater universe, in particular measuring how fast they're spinning, how spins are aligned, and so on. Uh, learning all kinds of things about environments like ours, how they developed, where they're going to be heading. So in finality, let me just end by saying our development, our destiny, has determined, been determined by our environment. It's been determined, though, by an environment on a 
on a scale hitherto unimagined. Thank you very much for your attention.